So for those of you who have just joined us, um, definitely pull up your chat box because that's how we'll be having a lot of the discussion today is over the Zoom group chat. So that way it doesn't bounce between the speaker views and it's not kind of bouncing around and can that can be kind of distracting and confusing, especially when we're running the slideshow. All right, so we'll just give it another minute or two to make sure that everyone gets a chance to join us. Um, I think we've got some people pending in the waiting room, so they're just um, connecting now. So we'll just give it maybe another minute or two. But thank you everybody for attending today. All right, so again, welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Renee and I am one of the environmental educators at the Quag Wildlife Refuge, as well as the animal care coordinator here. Um, and today we're gonna talk about a very interesting topic called the wonder of hummingbirds. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the species that we have here on Long Island, as well as how we can attract them to our yards, which is why I'm sure many of you have joined in on this presentation. Um, so I really hope that I can answer some of your questions about that. Um, I do like during this program too, um, everyone will have their sound on mute, but you can please type anything um, into the chat, any questions, maybe any uh, tricks or tips that you may have because I've found during this program, um, we have a lot of people who have, you know, maybe tried and maybe succeeded in attracting hummingbirds and their advice, you know, something different may work for everyone. So I think it's always good to share advice and this is a good program for that. So please type in anything as we talk as well, any questions, anything you may have to share. Um, so for those of you, I, I suspect many of you are familiar with the refuge, but for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Quag Wildlife Refuge, we are a 305 acre nonprofit preserve um, and we, have over seven miles of hiking trails. We also have a facility that houses permanently injured wildlife. So we've got fox and hawks and owls, many different types of uh, wild animals that rely on us for their care, as well as a nature center that houses many animals that were people's pets that they could no longer take care of. So we've got a variety of animals in there like chinchillas and big tortoises and turtles, some snakes, some creepy crawly insects. So we've got a whole bunch of different animals at the refuge. 
Um, and I am also the animal care coordinator here. So if you have any other animal questions, <laughs> I could try to answer them for you too. But um, we've been doing a lot of programs with the Quag Library. We love doing these programs with the library. Um, this is our community, so it's great to kind of reach out and talk to you all. So thank you again for joining us today. So to start off, um, we will get started with our slideshow. So there are 325 species of hummingbirds in the world, and eight of those regularly breed in the United States. Um, and only one of those species, though, is located on Long Island. Uh, we sometimes do have a second species that has changed some of its migratory path. Um, that's the, the Rufus hummingbird. And they have changed their migratory path before they move south. They sometimes come across the United States, then down. So we will occasionally during their migration see some sightings of those. Um, but you may be familiar with the one that we have here, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So the ruby-throated hummingbird is our, our prevalent hummingbird that we find around here. Um, and it has some bright emerald green or a golden green back. It has gray and white underparts. And then the, just the males, not the females, but just the males have a ruby red patch on their throat. But that patch is really amazing because it's not actually pigmented feathers. It actually is uh, iridescent microscopic structure of the feather. So in under specific light, it's actually illuminated to have red pigmentation. So in certain lighting, you might not notice that patch as much as others, uh, other times. Um, and hummingbirds are in the family Apodiformes. Um, and they're actually named after, that means no feet, because they have really short legs. They do, in fact, have feet, but they have really short legs that they can't actually walk or hop. So that's why they have to fly two places. Um, and just to kind of get an idea about how small a hummingbird actually is, one ruby-throated hummingbird weighs about the weight of two quarters, or of one quarter actually, or two and a half paper clips. So maybe you have a pap some paper clips lying around or a quarter lying around and you can kind of get a little bit better of an idea um, just how big those humming, or how small those hummingbirds actually are. They're about 0.2 ounces. Very, very small. So they are, um, their habitat is the Eastern North America deciduous woodlands. Um, they also live in Canadian prairies, old fields, forest edges, meadows, orchard streams, um, and in backyards as well. Um, and then they migrate typically to Mexico's dry forests and citrus groves and hedgerows and scrub habitats. Um, so if you look at our distribution map right next to that, you can see that the summer range is that located in the like orangey coloration. Um, and that's where when or when we would find them here on Long Island would be in the summer. And that's their breeding range. So they'll breed over here in the summer and then they migrate down um, south and to the middle of the country as well, depending on where they're migrating through or to or from. <laughs> They actually have the largest breeding range of any hummingbird. I don't know why, there we go. So they make very long winter migrations. At times they'll actually fly up to 500 miles nonstop. So that's a whole lot of flying for a very, very small bird. Um, and they'll fly across the Gulf Coast all the way down to Mexico. So they make these really, really long migrations. Typically, they'll arrive in Long Island in, in May, but we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Most of them will leave by August, but few, a few of them will actually stick around until, the, until October. Um, so a ruby-throated hummingbird can fly up to 30 miles per hour and when they dive they can dive about 60 up to 60 miles per hour so they're very very fast moving birds uh, they flap their wings an average of 53 beats per second 
so very, very quickly. Um, but because of how fast they fly and how fast um, their metabolism is, they have really high metabolic demands. Um, and when they finally are at rest, because of those high metabolic demands, when they're at rest, they're actually in a state of torpor. And torpor is kind of like a semi-hibernation state. So their body temperature drops and their heart rate goes down. So they utilize a lot less energy because otherwise they have to find more and more and more food all the time. But that's basically what they're doing most of the day or pretty much all of the day. And we'll talk about that too. They actually have some of the highest metabolic demands with the exception of a shrew. So those are the only um, animals or warm blooded animals that have higher metabolic demands. Um, when they're in a state of torpor, their heartbeat actually goes down from uh, to about 50 beats per minute from about 1200 beats per minute. So that's how much they slow down in that state of torpor, that state of semi-hibernation, that sleeping state. So nesting, maybe some of you have seen a hummingbird nest. You can type it in if you have. Um, they're amazing. Their they're small little nests are, they're, they take a lot of time and pay a lot of attention to building their nest. Um, typically they'll nest in deciduous or coniferous trees, so they're not super selective on the types of trees, but their nests are usually made of thistle or dandelion, um, and they're held together with spider silk or pine resin. So that's what they used to kind of bind those things together. Uh, and then they're disguised on the outside with lichens. So lichens are kind of similar to kind of moss. So they camouflage very, very well. They're only about two inches in diameter and one inch deep. So they are teeny tiny nest structures. And there's typically about one to three eggs per clutch. Um, and what's very interesting is the females will solely build this nest. So they build this nest all on their own without the help of the males. And they can have as many as three broods or three groupings of, of um, eggs and, and chicks and young per year. So that means that typically before the other ones have left the nest, they will actually start building. As they're caring for those young, they will start building another nest. So they're doing kind of double time. They're doing, the females are both feeding their young and building, simultaneously building another nest, which is really incredible that they are able to do that. Um, someone just asked in the chat, any photos of hummingbird nests that you can share with us? Good question. I do. <laughs> um, so here are some images of a hummingbird nest. So you can see those eggs are about the size of a Tic Tac. And there's a good image next to a penny so you can better see the size of that nest. They use their underside and their belly to kind of ground out the inside of the nest. And then you can see the lichens that perfectly camouflage it in with the trees, which is why it's extremely difficult to see a hummingbird nest. I'm just going to admit someone else that's in our waiting room. There we go. All right. So feeding and behavior. So hummingbirds will consume half their weight in sugar daily. Um, and sugar is really important for, um, for kind of powering and sustaining that high metabolism, but it's for little else. So they visit about five, uh, they feed about five to eight times per hour, and they visit about hundreds of flowers a day. So they're pollinating and a, a very, very large amount of plants. But what most people don't realize about hummingbirds is hummingbirds are also omnivores. So they also eat lots of small insects. They eat spiders, they eat gnats, um, mosquitoes and caterpillars. They'll even eat small bees. And then they'll also sip the sap from trees and drink the juice from fruit. So they rely on some other sources, not just solely nectar. And hummingbirds actually have really good color vision. And like many different species of birds, they can actually see ultraviolet light. So similar to what we see under a black light. So they are able to pick up uh, specific colored flowers and some flowers, um, some plants actually have 
ultraviolet kind of structures within them too that are illuminated. Um, and typically, hummingbirds are attracted to red orange flowers. They have a poor sense of smell, so usually the flowers that they're attracted to are unscented as well, and they mostly grow in full sun. And we're going to cover a couple different types of flowers that they, um, they typically are attracted to in just a few minutes too. So just to give you some other images of hummingbirds to see, there is a gnat flying around me. <laughs> if only there was a hummingbird in here to eat it. <laughs> um, but here are some images of hummingbirds. So, so that one with the extremely long bill is called a sword-billed hummingbird. That has the longest bill of any hummingbird. And the one on the tip of the pencil is called a bumblebee hummingbird. So it makes sense for its name because it's about the size of a bumblebee. Um, and that bee hummingbird is the smallest hummingbird that there is. So some ornithologists actually suggest that spiders are about 60% or more of a hummingbird's diet. So very surprising to many because insects are essential in providing vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, fats, oils, and, um, and, and fiber to their diet because the nectar provides really quick energy to sustain their high metabolic demands, but it does very little else for them. Um, and because their bills are really long and narrow, like that sword build that you just saw, they actually have to maneuver in flight very well. And when they're maneuvering or propelling themselves forward, it actually will help to move those insects down through their beak because they can't kind of manipulate them down without the force of that forward motion. So it helps it move it through the beak and down the throat. So they catch their prey in flight. So attracting hummingbirds, if you follow things and do things in your yard with all of the categories, you likely will attract hummingbirds. I only say likely because it does take a lot of persistence because hummingbirds have very, um, they have a lot of hummingbirds have the same spots that they go to every single year. Um, and they know the same flowers that they use all throughout the year. So they often rely on on specific places because they know that those are reliable sources. But I'll tell you and I'll show you in just a few minutes some ways that we can grab their attention and attract them to your space. So feeders, flowers, perches, water, shelter, and nest material are the categories that we're going to cover um, in more detail. All right, so nectar feeders, one of the first things many people think of to put up for attracting hummingbirds. When you look for a nectar feeder, you want to look for a feeder with colorful parts. The most specifically what you need to look for are on the bottom part where the hummingbird will drink the nectar from, the flowers are typically red colored flowers. Doesn't matter what color the rest of the feeder is, the feeder flowers where they're drinking the nectar from should be red or orange in color because that's what they're attracted to. Doesn't matter what color the rest of the feeder is, but if it's colorful, it will grab their attention more easily. So that's why colorful parts will often attract them better. Um, but do not color the nectar. This is important because a lot of the things that the nectar is colored with can be harmful to the hummingbirds. So the best mix um, for, for sugar water that you, know, you can actually just make in your home um, and you use one cup of water to a quarter cup of sugar. And you can do more of that if you'd like at a time. If you're doing more and you're gonna store it, the best thing to do is to boil the water before you add the sugar. And that just stores it a little bit better for a longer period of time. But it is also really important to clean your feeders routinely because you don't want that sugar um, mixture to ferment. So that is really important because you don't want to harm the birds and also they're not going to be quite as attracted to it if it's filled um, if with mold or, or, or fermented, could really harm them. 
Um, providing several spots to feed is best. Ruby-throated hummingbird males especially can be extremely territorial. So it is actually better to provide more feeders than one large feeder. So the more feeders you have, the more hummingbirds you're gonna attract. And then if you keep your feeders out of direct sunlight, you will have to change them less because they're not going to um, get as dirty and as fermented and moldy as fast. So it is important to, to clean those frequently though. Um, and then if you put them at least 10 feet away from a building and other kind of human structures, especially windows, because those are a little tricky to some birds, that's the best place that you can put them. So at least 10 feet away from structures like that. And because they're usually migrating here in early May, it's best to put them out in late mid to late April because that way as they're flying over, they'll see those above, um, they'll see them below and they'll come and hopefully be attracted to them in your yard. It's a good stop over place for them. And then they, if they have all their resources they need in your yard, then they'll probably stay. So here are some, oops, sorry. Here are some examples of feeders. So there's so many different types of feeders on the market. I had a hard time deciding which ones to include in the slide because there's a ton of variations. Some of them are glass, some of them are plastic, doesn't matter which um, you want to use. Um, but as you can see with all of the feeders, even though they're the feeders themselves are lots of different colors, they do have red feeder flowers attached to them. So that is important for attracting them, but many of the other ones are colorful or have colorful parts to them. All right. So in hot weather, you're gonna change those about every two to three days, that's best. And then it's also good to make sure that your feeders are visible from above. So don't have big branches that are kind of blocking them from sight because if the hummingbirds are flying over and they can't see them, they won't stop there for them. So native flowers is another thing that you can do and you can plant for hummingbirds. Uh, variety is key to native flowers because you wanna plant flowers that are gonna bloom at different times throughout the season that they're here. So throughout the summer, you want plants that will bloom steadily all throughout, um, up until like September or so. Uh, select native plants, and that is because native plants and hummingbirds have a long association in which plants served as a reliable source of nectar for the same time each year. So they evolved along with these plants. It's important for the plants to be pollinated so they know how to, the plants have developed things that attract the hummingbird specifically, like the shape of the flowers, the color of the flowers, that they're scentless. So they'll attract hummingbirds specifically. They co-evolved with these hummingbirds. So native plants is planting best because you're gonna attract native animals like hummingbirds. When you plant, you can also think vertical. So you can use trellises, you can use garden sheds, um, things that will support climbing vines and create kind of a terraced effect. So there's many different feeding levels for them and that's really good for them. Um, and then that, that way you can plant a variety of species as well. And then when you prune your plants or maintain your plants, you prune them because you prevent woody growth and that will actually favor the flower production of these plants. So you wanna keep trimming them properly um, to favor them to produce more and more flowers. And then when you are treating or, or caring for these plants, be sure to avoid insecticides and herbicides because these will affect um, the hummingbirds. It will also infect or affect, I'm sorry, the insects that the hummingbirds may be consuming as well as the nectar. So um, it's always really good for, for wild animals and, and um, just our natural habitats to avoid those insecticides and herbicides though. Um, and they're often most attracted to spaces that are about a quarter shade, a quarter partially shaded and half full sun. So that's the best that you can get um, for, for the, the proportions of your yard. 
And if you plant at least three of each species of plants, that's best because that will attract more hummingbirds um, because the quantity of nectar will be bigger or larger. So some flowers that you can plant, cardinal flower, and at this point actually, while we're talking about these flowers, if you have had any luck with specific flowers in your yard, definitely type them in for others to see. But cardinal flower, trumpet honeysuckle, jewelweed, bee balm, trumpet creeper, which is a nice climbing vine, red morning glory. Um, I have a couple others written down, let me see for you. Red columbine, Canada lily, Indian, Indian pink, red buckeye, mountain rose bay. So there's a lot of different flowers. And as you can see with all of these flowers, they're red to orange in coloration. They kind of have tubular shapes to them, which it fits the hummingbird's beak perfectly. And as the hummingbirds are feeding, it's important for the flowers to have that shape because you can see they will hit um, their, their faces and their beaks will get covered in the pollen from those structures within the flowers and help to pollinate those plants and propagate those plants. So that's important. Um, and they're all easy for the hummingbirds to kind of hover and sit while they're flying. So perches and shelter. So if you position your perches about 10 to 20 feet of the garden, um, that is best. If you have natural perches, that's great. So you may have natural perches in your yard that you don't need to add um, any perches like the one in the picture in the image. But males can be very territorial, so you want to provide open and obvious spots for them to rest because they want to be surveying the space as they're resting. Thank you for adding that. So hummingbirds are attracted to hibiscus and butterfly bushes. Nice, that's wonderful. Always good to know different plants that work. Um, the females are much different than the males because they provide they prefer um, more protected areas because they want to be hidden from view. They're a little bit more skittish than the males. So examples of perches that work well are clotheslines, twigs, overhead wires, shrubs, trees, other vines. Um, yeah, so all of the plants that I mentioned were native species and non-invasive species of plants. Absolutely, that is a wonderful question. So yes, they are all native and I might go back to that slide. So if any of you want to take a picture of this slide, that's a good thing to do. Um, that way you can kind of remember some of these plants. Um, but yes, some of you might have heard of jewelweed. Jewelweed is a really cool plant because jewelweed often grows right next to poison ivy. And jewelweed, the, if you kind of make a, a paste from the flowers of jewelweed, it can fight poison ivy. So pretty neat. All right. And then the hummingbirds, if you provide safe spaces for them to sleep, protected spaces for them to sleep, um, that's also a good way to keep them staying in your space, in your yard. So water sources are another way that you can attract hummingbirds. So each day, hummingbirds take in as much as eight times their body weight in water. A lot of that water is coming from nectar that they're drinking, but they will also sip dew from soaked leaves and other water sources. But they, they typically prefer sprinklers over most, most bird baths because most bird baths are typically too deep for them. So if you provide spots like shallow or elevated bird baths or drip fountains and misters, and I have some images on the next slide, those are best because there's no chance, because they can't walk or hop, they don't want to go into something too deep, so there's no chance of them drowning in more shallow baths. So you can see they specifically have bird baths designed for hummingbirds. A lot of the time, if you provide kind of a dripping sound or a fountain feature, that sound alone will actually attract a lot of birds to the area, the sound of the, the running water. So that's always a good way to attract them.
So you can see a lot of different style bird feeders, but they're all shallow for them, for the hummingbird specifically. All right, and something else that you can provide for hummingbirds is nest material. So when you're planting for hummingbirds, you not only have to include or should not only include plants that are important nectar sources, but you can also include plants that can be used for nesting material. So some examples of that are cinnamon fern, dandelion, pussy willow, or thistle plants. You can see the hummingbird in the image using some of that kind of fuzzy material um, from a plant. I'm not sure what plant it is actually in that image. But hummingbirds will also use moss and lichens, like you could see on the outside of their nest. They'll use small bits of barks, bark and leaves. They'll use feathers. They'll use the fuzz or fur or hair from leaves, cotton fibers, spider silk. Sometimes people say to put out, if you've brushed your pet, you can put out some of your dog hair or your cat hair. You do have to be careful with that because a lot of the time we treat our animals, um, our pets with like topical um, things for tick and flea control. And those are things to think about that might be harboring in their hair that might be harmful to the other wild animals. Um, I know some of the topical solutions that you put on them can be harmful to other species of animals, even though they're not harmful to maybe a dog. They, the topical solution you put on a dog could be harmful to a cat, and especially in certain quantities. So it's really important if you are to put out hair like that, make sure that your pet doesn't have any of that on their fur. Um, but these other plants and these other things are good things to have in your yard that will provide as a good source of nest material. All right. Okay, and just a couple last tips before we finish off, but if you tie red ribbons to trees, that will help hummingbirds to spot your yard from overhead. So that is a good way as hummingbirds are migrating through. So do this early, like late April. Um, as hummingbirds are migrating through uh, back up north, they will be able to spot those red ribbons and come down and check out your space. So that's a, that's a simple way. Those bright colors will attract them to your yard. And usually once you start attracting, attracting hummingbirds, they will, um, and once they discover your property and see that you have good resources for them, it's likely that those same individuals will then return each and every year after that. As long as there's reliable source of food and shelter for them. So that's what's important is once you attract them, you have to keep filling those feeders and keep caring for those plants because if it's an unreliable source, they won't wanna come back. But persistence is key. So it might take a while to first attract them and to first get them attracted to your yard, um, but start early too. So that way um, they've not, they haven't already established a space that they're kind of staying in. Any questions, anybody? So at this time, we can answer any questions. I'm sorry, I just kind of fussing with my thing. I want to actually go back a couple slides for you all. Oops, that's a bat PowerPoint, <laughs> not the one I'm looking for. Um, where did my hummingbird PowerPoint go? Here we go. I don't know why it just closed. I wanted to pull up that slide on plants for you again. That way if you want, or maybe this slide is good. What's the lifespan of a hummingbird? I don't remember. <laughs> um, I don't remember how long a hummingbird can live. Because of their high metabolic demands, I don't think it's quite as long as some other species of birds. My estimation would be probably around 15, 10, 15 years, because um, that seems to be the average for birds that size, but I don't know for sure. So that is just a guess. 
Very good question, though. <laughs> Any other questions, anybody? Well, so while I'm waiting to see if any of it any of you are typing up any questions. I do want to say that the refuge is still open for visitors. Um, our trails are open from dawn till dusk every day. Um, our nature center is unfortunately closed at this time, but you can still view all of our outdoor animals. You can view our tortoises in our outdoor greenhouse. And um, we have over seven miles of trails to hike. So come on down and see the refuge and definitely stay tuned. Hopefully we'll be doing more programs soon with the library or we're also doing different programs um, through the refuge as well. So definitely take a look at our website as well. Um, but if anybody doesn't have any questions, I just wanna say thank you all for attending. I hope you guys all enjoyed this PowerPoint and got some good resources out of it. Um, but I can leave on, oh, I got a, another question. Okay, aside from the ruby-throated, are there other types of hummingbirds in this area? So not usually, but the rufous hummingbird is sometimes cited as they make their migration, so earlier in the season. Um, so typically as they make their migration south, some of them are now coming across before they go south. So that is what's happening. Um, what is a hummingbird's predator? So sometimes other birds will prey upon hummingbirds. Um, that is primarily their larger, their um, like most abundant predator, but so birds of prey, but sometimes uh, like mammals, like raccoons and things can disturb hummingbirds and hummingbird nests as well, especially if they are in their state of torpor when they're at rest and they're more, more vulnerable. Um, so, so animals, even sometimes a squirrel can disturb a hummingbird nest if it's climbing in a, in a tree. Um, that's what's more, more vulnerable to predation. Uh, how far apart should feeders be if one has multiple in a garden? Um, so you do want them spaced pretty far apart. There's no specific kind of thing that says how far you have to space them. We usually space ours at least 10 feet apart or so. Um, that way they're not super territorial, but I think you could do probably, if you have a lot of feeders, you can definitely put them closer if need be, um, as long as you just have kind of little areas for them to rest and kind of tuck away in and, and shelter, um, that would be good. But the more feeders and the more plants, the better because then they're gonna be less territorial. That's the main thing is having more is better because they're gonna be less territorial to each other, not gonna fight as much over resources. So wonderful questions. Thank you guys for participating. Yeah, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I will leave up the chat. So I'm gonna probably close off our video and our sound, but if you have any other questions, I will keep the chat on maybe for five or 10 more minutes. So if you, or, or until maybe some of you have left and I see nobody's uh, left in our group. So thank you again. We hope to see you guys soon at the refuge, but otherwise stay tuned for some virtual programming. Bye everybody.